this webinar is now being recorded so um, that we can share it with the rest of the open education community who could not be here today. Um, let me start with um, a brief overview of today's agenda. Um, first, my name is Quill West. I'm the open education um, project manager at Pierce College in Washington State. I am also um, the president of CCC OER, and I'm really excited to be here today to talk about this topic. It's one of my um, ongoing favorite passions in open education. It's um, Transform, transforming learning with open education practices and pedagogy. And we have some wonderful speakers today. I'm really, really excited to hear what they're going to tell us. Um, so here's our agenda today. I'm going to do a brief overview of CCC OER and what we do. And then um, we're going to hear from our lovely speakers. So um, please give them your attention and time. Um, as you might have noticed, your microphones are all muted and we're going to try to keep that until we do open Q&A um, or until our speakers ask us not to. And that's because we're trying to limit background noise. So um, if you could please keep your microphone muted unless you're directly speaking to the webinar, that would be very helpful. Um, so, as a brief overview of the folks we're going to hear from today, this is not in order of appearance, actually, <laughs> um, but um, Karen Cangelosi from Keene State College um, is a professor of biology and a coordinator of faculty enrichment at Keene State College. She facilitates an open pedagogy learning community and is the co-leader of KSC Open, a domain of one's own campus project. Campus project. Um, Karen Spear headed a movement to replace traditional textbooks with OER and other freely available resources for almost all KSC biology courses and she incorporates methods of open pedagogy in all of her courses uh, and we're going to hear some cool things from her um, and then we're going to hear from a team Dr. Michael Mills and um, Shinta Hernandez from um, Montgomery College and actually I don't have their bios so I'm going to ask them to share briefly what they want us to know about their bios. Thanks, Quill. This is Mike Mills. I am Vice President of eLearning Innovation and Teaching Excellence at Montgomery College in Montgomery County, Maryland. I oversee all of our staff and faculty, professional development, distance education, and MC Open, which is our OER initiative. And I'm Shinta Hernandez. I am the Department Chair of Sociology, Anthropology, and Criminal Justice at two of our three campuses, and I also teach sociology. And I am a big proponent and advocate of anything and everything that requires us to improve social justice and student success outcomes for our students. Thank you so much. And also two of the coolest titles I've heard in a long time. Okay, so moving forward so I can give folks as much time to speak as they'd like. CCCOER is a community of practice and an organization that works to expand awareness and access of high quality open education resources. We're trying to help institutions institute open education projects at their, um, throughout the country and world. Um, we really believe in supporting faculty choice and professional development development, which is why we offer these webinars. We offer um, at least um, three during each semester. Um, so we try to do one a month, actually, uh, during the school year. And we offer um, our listserv. So if you don't know about the CCCOER listserv, please find out about it. You can find out more about our organization at cccoer.org. Um, we currently have 74 members in 32 states and we're really, really excited because our membership is growing and we're moving into the middle of the country, which is good. So um, we'd like to welcome our newest members, Windward Community College, Trident Technical College, Roxbury Community College, and Central Lakes College. It's very exciting to see new members on, on our list um, and we welcome everybody who would like to know more. Um, Okay, so actually, now I get to turn this over to, to, uh, to our first lovely presentation. So um, I'm gonna turn the screen over right now to Shinta and Mike. Okay, we, we are working to get our presentation up on the screen. Okay, all right. And um, while you're doing that, I want to say thanks to everybody who has been 
presenting or typing your your um, information about your colleges and, and open projects in the chat window, it's really good to share and hear from everybody in the community. So thank you for that. Thank you. All right, can everyone see the first page of our slides? Yep, you're set. You might want to set it to present, but you're good. Okay, great. All right, wonderful. So, so just very quickly, what we're presenting on is uh, really tying in the idea of open pedagogy and open educational resources to social justice. So we'll move on to the next slide. And really this is just a lay of the land to give you all an idea of how we're going to be presenting today. So um, Mike is actually gonna talk about the first three, which is an introduction to our institution, and then also a definition of how we perceive uh, open pedagogy. We're also gonna talk about um, renewable assignments, what that actually means. And then he will continue with a conversation or MC Open and talk about the Z courses that we have here at the college, and then eventually move back to me, and I'll talk about our faculty fellowship that is around the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And then we'll have a, a discussion question that we'd like to throw out to the audience, and then we will wrap up. So, Mike? Okay, thanks, Shinta. Uh, so, Montgomery College is located in the Washington DC suburb of Montgomery County, Maryland. We're a two-year public community colleges with uh, community college with three campuses um, that span the 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 county. Uh, the campuses are all different in culture. We have a campus that is more urban and then we have one that's more rural and then we have one uh, that is a, a little combination of both. Uh, 60,000 students, both credit and non-credit from about 160 different countries. So the diversity that we experience here uh, is exciting, but uh, also can be challenging. And then we have 500 full-time faculty and 950 part-time faculty who teach for us on the credit side. So, when Shinta and I looked at developing this fellowship, we were looking at how we define open pedagogy and renewable assignments. So I'm gonna to try to take us to a, a website um, and you should be able to see our website on uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Open Pedagogy Fellowship. And that first paragraph there really is the heart of how we define open pedagogy. And I, I think it's interesting that we each come to a, a conclusion of open pedagogy from different perspectives. You know, what does it mean for us? What does it mean for our institution? And here at Montgomery, um, we identify it as pedagogy that places the student at the center of the learning process in a more engaging collaborative learning environment in order Mike, to achieve, yes. I'm sorry to cut in on you, but can would you mind, um, I think your screen share is set just to your PowerPoint slides. So can you share your, we're not seeing what you're talking about. Is that better? Perfect, that's it. Okay. All right, so uh, that first paragraph identifies how we define open pedagogy, and it, it basically puts the student at the center of that learning process in order to achieve social justice in the community. So what we wanted to do with our fellowship is create an environment where students can make a difference in their own communities. Um, and we did that by focusing on renewable assignments and what David Wiley calls renewable assignments compared to those assignments that are disposable. And we, as we were going through this process, we spoke to different students and different student groups about what they liked in assignments. And to a person, each of the students said they did not want to just do assignments that 
they learn nothing from. Uh, that at the end of the assignment, it was simply an opportunity to turn something in and then they forgot the learning that took place. So we wanted to build a fellowship where the faculty created assignments that gave the students some options. And you know, what, what did that mean for the students? You know, it might mean a video, and Shinta will go into more details about this later, but it was really not just a paper, for example. We heard from a number of students who said, I am tired of doing research papers on something that mean nothing to me and that at the end of the semester, I'm not going to have any interest in, in recollecting. Uh, it will be something that, as Wiley says, is simply disposable. So we wanted to create assignments that students could build on uh, within the semester, but certainly could be built on from semester to semester uh, as well. And let me back to the slide presentation. So the, the fellowship in all of our OER work is under the umbrella of what we call MC Open. And the, the purpose is, is multifaceted. We want to increase student engagement, retention, and success, which we've been able to demonstrate. We have some data that, that show that. Uh, we wanted to provide a level playing field for our students by increasing access to course content. As, as many of us know, students who are not successful in our courses, uh, some of it has to do with the fact that they cannot get access to their textbooks until two or three weeks into the semester. So we wanted to create an initiative that would allow them to have access to course content on day one. Uh, certainly, we wanted to reduce the cost of education. Uh, to date, we have estimated uh, we've saved students about two and a half million dollars in textbook costs uh, with the thought that some of that money is going back into education, which reduces the time to degree completion. But we also know that some of that money is just being used for general living expenses, uh, daycare, rent, food, a gas to get to class. Uh, so the money that we, we say are saving students, I think has a direct impact um, on their education, but also just their general living. And then the fourth component is collaboration. And we wanted to create an environment where faculty were comfortable sharing <coughs> content, not only within the institution, but with throughout other institutions. Um, so some of our um, reasons for focusing on MC Open, as you all are, are well aware of the increasing cost of textbooks, uh, continues to, to rise. Uh, the average cost that students spend on textbooks continues to go up. You know, our latest research, about $1,400 um, for full-time students. And then the big reason that we wanted to focus on MC Open and our OER initiative is that it is a vital part of our academic master plan. Uh, within that academic master plan, there is a emphasis on reducing cost to education and time to degree completion. And we think that by providing a number of these OER courses, or Z courses as we call them, certainly fulfills <coughs> that aspect of the academic master plan. So our growth over the past uh, four semesters, and I say four semesters because we were fortunate to be part of the Achieving the Dream uh, OER initiative. And in the spring of 17, we were forced to identify in our student information system, um, our Z courses. So students can filter as they're registering by Z courses. So you can see the growth. We started with 62 courses, uh, 200 sections, and about 3,400 students. And this semester, we're up to about 8,500 students with 413 
sections of courses. So we're very pleased with the growth that we've experienced. Uh, we continue to bring on more and more faculty as you know they see the value of it as, as students start to advocate more for these courses and the textbook costs continue to, to rise. So as we moved into the fellowship uh, focus and focusing on social justice, and social justice was an integral part of our recent middle states reaccreditation process, I thought this quote was appropriate. I cannot say whether things will get better if we change. What I can say is that they must change if they are to get better. Um, and that was really a focus as we sent students out into the community with these different assignments. So Mike had mentioned a little bit about the Open Pedagogy Fellowship when he showed you the definitions of open pedagogy and renewable assignments. But really, just to give you an idea of our journey, if you will. So clearly, if you look at our timeline, we started off with Z courses because we wanted to make sure that we address the issues of college portability, particularly in the textbook area. But we also recognize that there's a whole lot more to the world of open than just saving our students money. So of course, naturally to them, that's, that might be what they're most concerned with. But as academics, we wanna make sure that they are learning and that they're remembering what they learn in the classroom. And then one of the pillars of Montgomery College is actually social justice. So last year, Mike and I went to Open Ed Conference, uh, Open Ed 17 Conference in Anaheim where we had we went through a presentation or a session and we recognized we learned from that session that there's is no one in the in the world i think is tying in open pedagogy with the united nations so he and i thought about well what if we did this at montgomery college and that led to some more brainstorming and and Earlier this year, in the spring of 2018, we started up started a the application process for what is now the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Open Pedagogy Faculty Fellowship. And one of the requirements that we did in, with our application process was that the faculty had to be divided into teams, of pairs of two, and sometimes three if, it, if the numbers were not even. Um, but they had to also be, be interdisciplinary and intercampus teams. And as he, as Mike pointed out earlier, we have three campuses. And the reason why we require that was really one, you know, one of the, the things that we do well here at the college is that we work very well in silos. So we needed to break that, break that culture a little bit. Um, but also too, and I think more importantly, is that we have to maximize equitable opportunities for our students. So what we didn't want, what we wanted to avoid was a bunch of faculty from one campus only applying for it, because then ultimately that means that students only from that campus can take advantage of this uh, wonderful opportunity. So we wanted to make sure that students from all campuses could, could, could partake in this. And you can see the data here on this slide. We have 15 faculty divided into seven teams across 12 disciplines. Uh, and these assignments are in 16 courses across 25 different sections. And right now to date, we have over 570 students that are doing these assignments and thus impacted by these assignments. And in early spring of 2019, in just a couple months, we're gonna have a faculty student showcase where we will get to see some of the students work and how they were able to put themselves uh, out there in the communities to improve social justice for all of us. Now, when Mike and I were in the um, Open Ed Conference this past month, we were told and very pleasantly surprised that our work was going to be featured in the United Nations Open Con 2018 conference in New York City uh, in mid-October. So when, unfortunately, we weren't able to go and attend that, but we did see it live. And um, I'm, I'm not sure if we are going to show, it's a very short clip. It's just a minute, I think. Mm -hmm. And consider students at Montgomery College who work under the guidance of driven and brilliant faculty to fix specific SDGs such as reducing inequality or gender equality and empower them to begin, become agents of change in both their communities and the wider world. Post-secondary institutions worldwide would do very well to follow the lead of Montgomery College in establishing SDG open pedagogy fellowships for faculty. And educators worldwide can draw inspiration from their peers who openly share their innovative practices in the open pedagogy notebook. Okay. 
Um, and so obviously we're, we're very honored and very pleased that that work got featured at, at the Open Con at the United Nations. Now, just very quickly, um, for the sake of interactivity and kind of just to get your, your minds going here, if you could just take a look at this question, the question is, how would you engage your students in social justice efforts? Take about a minute maybe to think about it, and then a minute to just put it in the chat box. Um, and just so that we could share it with everybody. And we're not necessarily gonna uh, go through it all because of the interest of time, but I think this allows us to see what you're all thinking. Maybe each of us can, can learn a thing or two from one another. And then Mike, we'll close. We'll take a minute to think about it, and then you can continue while everyone tries to answer. Sure. Uh, here are some links uh, to a few resources. The, the first one is the link to the United Nations SDG Fellowship page that we showed earlier. And then the second link is just the link to our MC Open site. Uh, some resources there that we share with students, that we share with faculty, and it also provides a list of all our Z courses. Uh, so students can go there and quickly identify courses that they're interested in taking. And with that, um, we'll turn things over to Karen, but here's our contact information. If you're interested in reaching out to either one of us, we'll be happy to speak with you. We'll be happy to you know, get on a, a conference call and speak to team members from your institution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. While Karen's setting up her slides, let's go ahead and keep generating ideas in the group chat for ways your <laughs> students can address um, social justice. I think it's wonderful. We already have a couple of good ideas in there. Um, and Karen, go ahead and share your screen. Okay, I just want to say um, really appreciate everybody that is here today and I'm excited to talk about my work. It was really great to hear what the folks at Montgomery College are doing. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what it's like to sort of be an open pedagogy professor on the ground a little bit. Um, <clears throat> and I think that uh, it, it's awesome how much students are saving money for textbooks and how that's such a big problem for sure, lowering costs for students. But that the real power of open is about learning and not so much about textbooks and tools. And so when we look at uh, open educational resources and the open license, um, for me, it's really talking about how we bring access to knowledge and but that's transitions into a much greater spectrum of access in open pedagogy and in open pedagogical practices. And so this diagram that I created is a little bit complicated and it's based a lot on the ideas of other people such as uh, Robin DeRosa and, and other folks that have been doing this for quite a while. Um, but I think the idea that open licenses allow free access to knowledge, but the real gold here is the student agency that emerges now that students can create knowledge and they can share that knowledge with others others and now they're engaging in their communities and that agency can blossom as students are taking more ownership over what they learn and how they learn it and so they're creating content but they're also doing yeah sorry to interrupt you are you planning to share your screen because we're actually oh <laughs> no worries <laughs> ah rats you have some, you have some okay <laughs> don't want to miss them okay i thought i did that already obviously i didn't is it, uh, can you see it now? Did you click on the share button? Yep. Thought I did that before too, but. You just have to find your slides. You should, you should see a little, uh, some tiles. Yep. And you select uh, the tile that had, you probably have a lot of windows open, right? <laughs> Really? Oh. <laughs> hmm. Well, this is embarrassing. So you're not seeing. Let's see. There we go. Now, is that it? Except for we're seeing your email now. Ah, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. Dang it. 
All right. That's really bad. Just take, no, no, take your time. Um, you know, we can also I show you slides I, because you sent them over, but. Okay. Is that, is that now? Oh, fuck. Oh, no. Would you like us to show your slides and then you can just tell us to click? <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, no, no problem at all. Quill, do you want to do that or would you like me to? You better because I don't think I downloaded them. I'm sorry. I don't know why. I wish I could do it from here. Oh, yeah. I there they are. Are they are? Are you seeing them now? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Just set them to present. You're good. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm going to try. I know in the interest of time, I'm going to try to uh, pick up. Uh, can you see this big diagram now? Yep. It's so pretty. Okay. Thank you. All right. What I was talking about is how um, open pedagogy definitely has um, a lot of realms to it. And this is kind of complicated. And that for me, the real goal is that students can create knowledge and share knowledge with others and engage in their communities. And they can even do things such as design their own um, assignments. They can write syllabus. They can determine attendance policies, contribute more broadly. And so for me, the real essence of open pedagogy is about students taking control of their learning and contributing and connecting with a larger world. And so when we think about open pedagogy and open educational resources, open pedagogy, as Robin DeRosa says, is, is the verb. It's the way that we can actually um, enact these kinds of things that we're talking about. Um, and when we consider the digital tools that we might be able to use as practitioners of open pedagogy, we look to those that help students enact this agency, help give them control both over what they're learning and how they're learning. And I've relied very heavily on the domain of one's own project at Keene State for this to help my students discover their interests and direct their learning processes around these interests and to help provide a platform for them to share outside of the classroom and collaborate with others. And so when, when Robin talks about contributing to and not just consuming from the knowledge commons, students actually have a tangible way of doing this on domain spaces. It's not the only tool where this could be done, but it's certainly a powerful one. Um, this, for example, this student here wrote something that she was interested in, and not only did she learn some basic content in genetics, like about alleles or phenotypes, but because this piece and the site itself is openly licensed, it was picked up by a blogger in Turkey who then reposted it on his site, and this increased the readership many times over. So contributing useful knowledge to the world, to others who are also interested, is both empowering to students and a powerful way for students to learn. Um, here's another example. As, as students think about audience that's beyond their professor, that larger audience, they start to create differently. Their work is contextualized differently, like this piece about spring break. So it's not just about marine pollution and its effects on food webs, but it's a message to other students about how their behavior is affecting the marine environment. And so Martha Burtis reminds us that students aren't just going on the web, they're constructing it. And they have a lot of really great stuff to say. Um, and so these are not these static portfolios, but they become these dynamic learning spaces where students read and they comment on each other's work. They're adding, they're deleting. I find that my students are constantly shifting the look and feel and content of their domains all the time. And so it creates this very collaborative, interactive uh, communication space that students are actually excited about working on. And so when you produce work that you've chosen to do, you don't want to throw that away. You know, having your work live beyond the end of the semester, um, as Mike and Shinta were talking about, is really extraordinarily important. And it seems to me that the more control that I give to my students and the more choices they have, the more they actually discover and produce exciting, uh, content-rich, and even scientifically rigorous work. <clears throat> and so OER doesn't really have to look like a typical textbook either. On websites that I create for my courses, I will syndicate my students' work there so it becomes a compilation of stuff. And admittedly, it's um, somewhat messy and incomplete, but it's, there's also a lot of really good rich material there. And there's so much more that's just waiting to be improved by the next class. And I think that's really where the value comes in. It's that, it's that process, not the product. <clears throat> I make use of other tools like the web annotation tool Hypothesis 
where students can have discussions. They can talk about a scientific article. Um, and because it's public, you can bring in others from outside of the classroom. You could bring the author to the article in. You can bring in graduate students, people from other classes. And so there's a lot of ways to think about emphasizing community and collaboration. We used to talk about sort of you know, community and collaboration over content, but really community and collaboration leads to content. And especially in STEM courses where people worry about, am I covering enough of the material? Um, in fact, students find their way to even more content that you may have even thought about covering to begin with. Um, another tool that I uh, make quite a bit of use of is, is using social media. And when you leverage these kinds of digital tools in an effective way, they can be really powerful for open pedagogy. Students can build these valuable personal and professional learning network spaces where they're engaging with others. Um, they can participate in civic actions. They help drive traffic to their domain spaces. It provides a way for them to be connected to local communities, to regional communities, and to global communities. And I've used um, Twitter extensively. I have hashtags for my different courses. You can see marine biology, animal behavior, invertebrate zoology. Um, and that uh, my students are sharing out things that they're interested in. They're having conversations. They're connecting to people all over the world. One of my students had this wonderful uh, relationship with an Australian scientist where they were talking about his work. And so it's really uh, quite a powerful tool. Um, and so I want to also take a little bit of time for a minute to talk a little bit about the relationship between open pedagogy and what open science is. And, and first, what I want to do is emphasize that as instructors of science, we aspire to teach not just the content of science, but the processes of scientific investigation and scientific methodologies. And it's often said that students learn science by doing science, which is why we have labs. It's why we integrate students into our own research programs. It's why we engage them in independent research projects. Um, but what does it really mean to do science openly? Um, so open science is about, it's actually about changing the culture of scientific investigation and communication. So um, <clears throat> there can be a lot of competitiveness in the scientific world, you know, how grants are given, having to be the first one to discover something. I know one of the first things that I was taught as a young scientist was actually to be kind of secretive because you don't want to get scooped, right? So at conferences, you would share final results. Once your experiments were done and completed and you're ready to publish, you can talk about that. But you should be very guarded about anything that you're working on in the early stages. And so that sort of um, different take on the value of science can be really turned on its head when we think about what open science can bring. So proponents of open science really promote the idea that science is more valuable, it can proceed more effectively if it's transparent, right? If it's, it can be much more widely collaborative in all stages from developing hypotheses to designing experiments to your methods that you're putting out there. Um, to your field sites. I, I remember a, a grad student a friend of mine back in school wouldn't tell me where her field site was because she was afraid I was going to scoop her and go collect that data before her. And so <clears throat> what, we're, what the open science community is talking about is that actually more science can get done and it can be more relevant and that it can help advance science in ways that support the public good, not just individual scientists or institutions or corporations that they work for. And I believe that as science undergraduate educators that we can actually teach and model these values and practices to our students now as you know when they're beginning so that by the time they get to graduate school or they have jobs where they're acting as scientists that they can understand the value of, of open science. And so <clears throat> earlier I was talking about open pedagogy in science which could be applied to talking about open pedagogy across a whole range of disciplines. And what I'm trying to explain here is a little bit of what I call the pedagogy of open science, which is about teaching students these practices of transparency, teaching them the value and processes of opening, opening up scientific work. And 
there's interplay between these two things and the ways in which we want to teach our students about science and about how to act as scientists. I think openness can really uh, bring quite a bit of wealth to that idea. <clears throat> Here's an example of a student of mine who's sharing uh, methods and data from an independent research project. She did a progress update like every week for several weeks. And um, again, there's, there are ways in which we can teach our students about how to share openly all of their work. Um, and that includes all the way through to final communication, having students um, publish uh, research articles openly in open access journals. This one is co-authored by a, a colleague of mine along with some undergraduate students at Keene State along with other scientists from around the world. Um, so I believe that we can make science better by making it open and just as we can make the learning of science better by using open educational practices. And so when we talk about things like agency and exploration and hypothesizing and questioning and connection, collaboration, creativity, contribution, communication, experimentation, analysis, interpretation, all of these things, curiosity, <clears throat> we're talking about all of these things when we talk about open pedagogy. Right? But we're also talking about all of these things when, we, when we're talking about scientific practices. And so really valuable scientific practices that are going to um, most be relevant and be for the public good. And, and we have to start with our students before they um, go off into careers and really help them understand the value of this. So I will, I will stop there so that we do have some time for questions. Thank you, Karen. Um, you might want to leave your si slides here because we have okay. some questions. All right, sure. <laughs> so the first is, um, I'm just going to read it straight from the chat. Um, could this speaker, oh, maybe I'm going to read it from the chat. There was a question asking you to think about um, or to talk about science deniers and how that plays within the process of open science. But like people that just deny science at all, like uh, climate change denial? Yeah, the question says, and maybe we can ask for some clarification, mm -hmm. Clarification. it says, could the speaker address how they might work with an anti-science mindset and okay. science deniers in an open science environment? Yeah, um, well, I think in a lot of ways, like we've, um, as science educators have dealt with science deniers, uh, especially creationists and climate change uh, deniers for forever, like I can remember dealing with that forever. And I think the fact that um, we can have more public conversations about what we're doing and looking at the value of the work that we're doing that open just actually can help to provide a, a broader uh, experience of education about what scientists are doing right and so maybe we can address that a little bit more for, so like for example if we say um, oh well there's all this ice core data and you can measure the you know, parts per million of carbon dioxide for many, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of years back, and we can see that there's a relationship between CO2 and temperature. And so for me to talk about that in my class is one thing, but if we can put that out to the world, if my students are talking about it, if that graph is explained in 12 different ways by my different students and the, and the public are talking about it and they're reading about it, I think there's ways in which openness can help people uh, understand some of these scientific um, pieces that we're looking at, and it can kind of demystify it a little bit. I'm, I'm often talking about demystifying science, like the idea that, well, science is so hard, you know, and that, you, you know, you can't do it unless you're really smart. And, you know, most of our students are going to drop out, and I think that's actually blatantly just not true, and that there's a lot of um, mystery creating around science, and so that if we can be open about the fact that anybody can actually learn these kinds of scientific concepts and scientific vocabulary, that, that might help us to actually address the, the deniers uh, little bits at a time. So I hope that kind of gets to the heart of the question there. I think it's a beautiful answer. Thank you. <laughs> um, um, I want to also um, invite Mike and Shinta back into our conversation because we had some um, 
we had some questions for them. And Jairo, I might need you to clarify because your question for Mike and Shinta was, was about um, if their project was written into your QEP, and I'm not familiar with that term, QEP. Folks, we have plenty of times for plenty of time for questions because our speakers stuck to their time limits so beautifully today. Um, so, if you have questions for our speakers, um, I would love to have your any questions you might have. I've been looking for them throughout the chat, but if I missed anything, please ask again. Um, okay, QEP is Quality Enhancement Plan. Uh, so it, it's it's part of an accreditation process. It looks like in part of the country that I don't live in. That's why I didn't know what it was. So, um, Mike, do you want to talk about that maybe with your process and program? Sure. Um, we don't have, from a middle states perspective, it, the requirement um, to file a quality enhancement plan. But in our most recent self study, which we finished in the spring. Our MC Open initiative and certainly the fellowship was part of our, our self-study uh, because our self-study was focused around the concepts of innovation and social justice. So what we were doing was certainly an integral part of those two concepts. So it got some good play in our self-study. And to add to that, uh, we also have, our institution has an academic master plan and the Z course work is in, is included in that. However, this is gener relatively new since the publication of the recent academic master plan. So I'm sure at some point, you know, we would integrate all of that into the other plans. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and I have a question maybe for everybody and maybe we can do some, um, brainstorming together, um, Paul asks, what sorts of things could be open pedagogical exercises in a math class? Um, ooh, my chat window moved. Um, <laughs> would students creating videos of themselves presenting review problems be an example? And I think actually that is a great example of an open pedagogy project um, because they, if students are sharing those outside, but what other math things have our presenters seen done um, or any ideas around open math, open pedagogy and math? Sure, this is Mike. Um, one of our teams that included a math person, an English person, and a sociologist uh, tackled a, several different projects and the student outcome, the student product, was the creation of infographics. So instead of just having basic math problems, uh, they, they came to the conclusion that they could portray those solutions in an infographic better than they could in just a math equation. So, you know, the goal is to create this infographic based on the social justice issue that they're, they're examining and then post that and create it as, a, as an open uh, format, in an open format. I could jump in here a little bit too. Um, I think that there's ways that you can think about um, the ways in which math is so relevant to our lives in general, like like the the <clears throat> you can have math problems whether they're looking at something in the context of finances or many ways in which there are relevant things that we need to calculate when we're balancing our checking <laughs> account or something like that. And so I think that um, when students can do things like create their own assignments, they could create their own math word problems, right? And then those kinds of things could become part of an assignment database that they could share with other students that have to answer the problems and then they create their own questions. So those are just some kinds of examples that I think like regardless of what discipline you're talking about, you can have students that are participating in the in the creation of the learning itself and then they're sharing those kinds of things with others and then engaging communities that way. The 
that's an excellent point. I think sometimes the best way to foster a process is to let students kind of discover it and show it on their own. Um, so we have a question I, and uh, the, we have a lot of questions here about how to talk with an institution or faculty to get them to adopt a resource. So let's start with the one um, and, and feel free to throw this back to the community because it's not specifically about pedagogy, but I'm, I'm struggling, struggling with the process of OER textbook adoption. We spent considerable time and money developing an OER math book for adult education students. The students love it. The math teachers aren't using it. Any ideas? Sure. This is Mike. When we rolled out our OER plan, uh, it was really a three-prong approach focusing on faculty, administrators, and students. And we made a conscious effort to get the buy-in of faculty and administrators first. Um, we did not want to go to the students and to the student government and talk about this initiative and this plan because we thought, well, they're gonna get on board right away because it's gonna save them a lot of money. But we wouldn't have the supply in courses to meet that demand. So we didn't want to turn the students off. So we built uh, the plan around getting faculty buy-in, administrator buy-in before we went to the students. So we had a, a, a strong supply of courses and then uh, it continued to grow that way. So we, we really focused on getting that, that college buy-in first and the employee buy-in. I think, yeah, that's a that's a great answer. Kind of having the buy-in of faculty up front is good. And I think with the the situation that you're talking about that, that was presented here, um, it could be because you've created a resource that hopefully has an open license on it and can be changed. There might be some work that you can do on the other end asking faculty to make changes that make the book something they can use in their teaching. Um, because they have to be comfortable with it for it to work for the students. So um, maybe they have some ideas for changes and adaptations to make what you have as an existing resource better that, and able for them to use. Um, and then I encourage people to chime in if you have other ways of approaching this. Um, but I'd love to get back to an open pedagogy question, which is a great one for librarians, um, and I'm biased there. Um, are there any specific way that librarians have supported students participating in open pedagogy at your schools? Offering technology tools and training software, some basic ways that jump to mind, um, but I'm trying to think more broadly. So what role can librarians play as supporters in open pedagogy? For our fellowship, we had a librarian as part of our core team uh, because we we wanted the faculty to know that the librarians were available for students to go to when they were researching their, their topic. So if the faculty member provided an assignment that, real, that forced the students to go into the community. We wanted the students to be able to go to the librarian as a resource. Uh, so, you know, we often think about the librarian being central to the faculty member's role. But for this fellowship, we wanted everyone to know that the librarian was central to the student role. And to add to that, this is Shinta. Um, over the summer when we required, that's when our fellowship actually started, when we required faculty to attend several meetings, one of the meetings was to include the librarian and other resource people at the college to do a presentation on the things that they could offer to the students, but also to the faculty. So when the librarian talked about all these wonderful uh, resources and services, so many of our faculty said, wow, I didn't even know we had that. So at the very minimum, our faculty are understanding more and more of what we offer. And then of course they can bring that forward to the students. Quill, I, I want to um, go back just for a second, if I could, about the, the institutional buy-in. And one of the things that we, we did by focusing on open assignments was really flip the, the process a little bit. You know, we often think about starting with a totally open course, 
uh, we wanted to change that for those faculty who were a little hesitant to make it their entire course open, we started with assignments so that they could see what was involved in an open assignment and they could build from there, uh, eventually getting up to having their ent entire course open. Yes, thank you, Mike. That's a great point to go. Um, maybe you're piecing something together. You don't have to do it all at one time. Um, I want to address, this is a very good specific question about how to make this work. Keith asks, I had an assignment last year where I wanted students to remix materials from open um, geology texts um, and add original content relevant to our area. Each student was responsible for one chapter topic uh, and then remixing it. Students had trouble with the idea of open resources and reusing remixing them. I think because we spend years telling them not to plagiarize. I wonder if the pres um, presenters have experienced this and if so, how did they address it? And Karen, this might be a good one to have you chime in on first. Uh, yeah, I think that's a really good question because um, there is a, a lot of sort of untraining that we have to do with our students, like to, to think about like, um, what is it that you used to do? You know, you used to memorize stuff, you would regurgitate it, right? And when you were writing a paper, you, were, you would get some sources and you had to be very careful to put things in your own words. And, and so I think that when we're asking students to create OER and they're trying to write things, like, like there still is the, um, there still is the practice of giving people credit for their work and and you know being able to you know attribute the authors of things and so I think that actually depending on the kinds of tools that you use I know that when my students are creating things on web domains it's very easy for them to hyperlink to something else and so that can that can definitely help with um, having students be able to be attributing back to their sources and to get the idea that they're not, um, you know, they're not just copying and saying, this is my own. They're, they're copying it and they're using it and they're saying, this is really great. <laughs> I'm going to incorporate this into something that I want to share, but I'm acknowledging that somebody else wrote it and I'm linking back to what they said and I'm putting the CC license on it. Um, that they used. And so I think that opening up work and sharing actually helps to dissolve the plagiarism question a little bit more. We can worry less about su students stealing and think a lot more about students sharing. Does that, does that get at what you're asking? I have to, I have to say yes, and I, I so am okay. going to I'm going to proudly attribute that, that last statement, worrying less about students stealing and more about students sharing is a beautiful idea. Um, Thank you. And I also um, just want to add, if I may, this is Shinta again, please. that when the assignments are all said and done, the all of the products from those classes, from the students' work, will also be open. And in fact, we had them sign a waiver to let them know that this will be out there in public. You know, they still get the attribution, but uh, the whole world can, they can share their knowledge with the whole world about how they're going to, uh, or how they have involved themselves in the community at, so as to reach those uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So that's another way that we're, we're making things open on our end. I think for me also, when I, when I think about um, the way in which I moved into incorporating open pedagogy into my classes, that it wasn't about thinking about just technique or methodology. It's, it's really about shifting a framework and a philosophy. You know, the way that you look at your students, the way that you, if you see them as a whole human beings that have something to bring to the table and that they're looking to learn and find value. And we're not just trying to download content into their brains and look at them in this very unidimensional way. So shifting that sort of philosophical framework about who we see our students as and what we want them to do can really facilitate that learning. So those questions about like, how do I get open pedagogy into my class? You know, I would start with, well, how do you think about your students as learners? You know, what, what would you like them for, to be able to do? And what are your broader goals? Like, do you want them to be able to be agents of social change? Um, and then I think the answers just 
come a lot more easily because you're just talking about different kinds of tools and techniques that people have used, but they have to be contextualized in that philosophy of thinking about what does openness bring to my practice as a teacher. And I would encourage faculty to talk with their students about what open means to them and what kind of assignments they enjoy doing and let them be part of the learning process. Those are both amazing points to kind of, I don't know, end on, but I don't want to end yet. I, um, we still have five minutes, but I want to make sure that we do kind of the general community announcements um, before we continue taking questions, because there are a couple more we can ask if everybody can stay tuned. Um, so first, the slide you've been looking at for the last few minutes says so stay in the loop. Um, and this is just a way, um, to, a reminder to connect back to the CCCOER website. It's cccoer.org. And to maybe join our community email list if you are not already on it. We have discussions just like this one there often, except they're in writing so you can see them. We also share open resources with each other there. Um, and we connect as a community. So so it's a great place to kind of find out more about what's going on with CCCOER. Um, and this is very exciting because this is the newest slide about Open Education Week. Open Education Week 2019 was announced, um, I don't know, I think it was two weeks ago, but we haven't put it in a slide deck yet, so here it is. Um, so. Um, open Education Week is going to be March 4th through 8th, 2019. Um, during Open Education Week, we share our triumphs with Open Education. We talk about, um, so there's all kinds of different ways people do that. The call for participations is open now. Um, and I want to bring, bring back the idea of open science because this is a great place to think about. This would be, during Open Education Week, would be a great time to share your experiences with open science if you happen to be embracing it um, in the form of web webinars like this one or even blog posts. Um, people do events at their own institutions and we will be talking more about this as, as the date comes closer. But if you have ideas for Open Education Week, please join our call for participation. Um, we have another webinar in December. Um, so if you're at all interested and if you found this platform helpful, um, we're going to do a webinar on open education research, um, the impact of OER adoption on cast outcomes and stakeholder perceptions. Uh, speakers will be people from the open ed group fellows. So they're people who've been training and working within the COOP framework. If you're um, aware of that, it's, it'll be a wonderful webinar. We have a great group of people who will be sharing their experience with doing research on open education and trying to design and figure out the efficacy of OER. Um, okay, so we did have some more questions if people want to stick around. I think I have, we still have about three minutes left of our time. Um, so I'm going to reopen my chat window, which went away. Um, um, I believe we had some more questions about kind of the specifics of how to design an open ped project. And I think Karen and Mike both said great things about asking the students what they want to know, but also um, kind of thinking about your practice differently and thinking about how students play within your educational practice differently. And I think that's really great. Um, I want to open it up for one more question. If anybody, if I've missed anything, please get it into the chat window or join us. You can, you can use your mic now. You just have to click the mute button so we can hear you. Well, there was a, a question in the chat about incorporating accessibility into the work students are sharing. And uh, I think that's an excellent question. And honestly, I don't think Shinter or I have, have really thought about that uh, from the perspective of compliance. Uh, so that's something we're gonna have to go back and, and really give some, 
some thought to? How do we work with students to make sure they're aware of accessibility guidelines and accessibility issues? I have some interesting experience with that, if you don't mind me taking over and giving an answer. Um, in, in, my, um, in my US history class, my students have been working over time on a, an original research project, a history research project about our college. And um, <laughs> it's full of, of images of newspaper articles because they're, it's based on articles written by the student paper 60 years ago. And so, I am um, always asking my students, what I do is I start with, imagine that you can't read this PDF, what should we do next? And so I ask the students to do their own assessment of whether or not this resource is accessible to everybody in their community. Um, and then they make decisions about what they should do. So they're the ones who said, oh, we should retype all of these articles so that a screen reader could read them. Um, and we should do a description of each of the pictures here so people understand Understand, like what's in the pictures and it drives them to greater research like I want to know who these people are in this picture and they're not captioned so I have to go find that information if I can so they've done some amazing work on trying to up the accessibility of a resource that is not accessible to anybody outside of our institution and still they until they work on it because it's hidden away in our college archives I'm seeing that we've gone to the hour plus some. Um, and I want to thank again Karen and Mike and Shinta because you had some amazing things to show us. I am just so impressed with the projects you have going on. And I'm really, really excited to see open pedagogy embraced so widely across our, our institutions and to see it working. So thank you so much for your presentations and for your time and for people who participated in the webinar. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much for inviting me. It was really great to be part of this. Thanks, and, Quill. And same here. Thank you very much for the opportunity.